Well, first off, uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to uh, share some of this work that I've been doing uh, this semester. Um, not sure where the end goal of this work uh, will end up, um, but I'm excited by the story, so hopefully uh, the same uh, is true with all of you. So on a cool January night in Dallas, Texas, patrons filed into Margot Jones' Theater 54, awaiting the premiere of a new play entitled Oracle Junction. Established in 1947, Margot Jones' Theater, you can see Margot here, uh, was the first theater in the round where the audience surrounded the actors around the stage. By 1954, Jones had an established career as a director, helping produce over 50 stage productions throughout Texas and New York. It's delayed. <clears throat> On January 4th, Sorry Scott's Oracle Junction hit the stage, a play about the first cooperative hospital in the United States. Its title, Oracle Junction, perhaps was a nod to the divine intervention of one immigrant doctor bringing cooperative medicine to rural western Oklahoma, seemingly against all odds. Roots of the word oracle could mean, or typically means a priest acting as a medium through which a prophecy was sought. Junction might refer to the crossroads of this immigrant doctor and other doctors in Oklahoma who were at odds with one another throughout the quarter century that the hospital operated. In any case, in order to research the hospital and the illustrious career of Dr. Shaded, who had created it, Scott traveled to Elk City, Oklahoma, and spent two weeks interviewing Michael Abraham Shaded and browsing his correspondence and hospital records in order to write her three-act play. And you can see the scenes, three acts, there's uh, six scenes total. So this presentation seeks to trace Shaded's life and just how he was able to establish socialized medicine in a place like rural Oklahoma. Shaded's life was theoretically the quintessential immigrant success story. A man born into poverty overseas, overseas was captivated by the lure of success in the United States. He travels to New York City, working jobs and saving for school. Upon graduation, he finds work and establishes a successful medical career, and scene. However, with the case of Michael Shaded, his career accomplishments experienced mixed results. To many farmers in western Oklahoma, his vision had provided adequate medical care for a fair price. To organized and quote unquote regular doctors, he was a nuisance and a threat to their profession, challenging this fee for service medical system where doctors could charge patients for each visit and often determine their own prices. Several scholars have explored Shaded's life and often documenting this rise and fall of the hospital and the numerous legal and professional battles between the doctors and the community hospital. Moreover, Shaded's name pops up in public articles framing the once lost opportunity for cooperative medicine during the Great Depression. These scholars depict the unique case as an anomaly, a missed opportunity for a form of socialized medicine in the United States. Here, though, I draw on Oklahoma's rich history of an agrarian populist tradition to add to this conversation and argue that Shaded, although he played a, a vital role in the establishment of, and success of the hospital, his actions were guided by a revived socialist tradition that had been suppressed in the wake of the Red Scare and World War I. Shaded knew this fact and often leaned into the Farmers Union for funding for his patients and legal protection. The case of the community hospital in Elk City was in fact an anomaly, dependent on this unique social, political, and economic conditions in Depression-era Oklahoma. And, like Sari Scott had envisioned, a story that was worthy of the stage. Perhaps not that delayed. Perfect. By 1945, when Scott visited Elk City, Shaded had been practicing medicine in Oklahoma for nearly 40 years. Born in a town of nearly 3,000 people on the eastern slope of Mount Lebanon in Syria in 1882, Shaded was the 12th child born to a newly widowed mother. He went to Beirut for schooling in 1893 when he was 11, and he claimed that after he graduated the American University there, quote, it was only natural that his thoughts should turn to America, the land of opportunity, the land he had come to know and love through his association with his outpost in Beirut. Shaded knew his family could no longer support him and help pay for his medical schooling, so he turned to New York City where he sold jewelry to save for medical school. And after a few semesters at John Tarleton College and nearly $5,000 saved, 
he enrolled at Washington University in St. Louis. So he was born somewhere over here. Shade had visited family in Illinois the summer before medical school and learned that after an unsuccessful stint as a shoe shop owner, his brother had learned about new land open for settlers in Oklahoma Territory and wanted to become a farmer. Shade had loaned his brother $1,000 to pay for 160 acres in Greer County where his mother, brother, sister, and brother-in-law all moved and settled. Shade had graduated medical school in 1906 and he worked as a doctor's assistant in Missouri before moving to Stecker, then Oklahoma City, and finally in Carter in 1912. That year, this is Beckham County, um, in Greer County down here. That year was an important uh, one for Oklahoma Socialist Movement, 1912. From 1910 to 1912, Oklahoma Socialists had increased their votes by nearly 70%. And in the 1912 pres presidential election, over 40,000 Oklahomans had voted for Eugene V. Debs. However, Oklahoma's populist tradition dates back to the late, 19, or, yeah, late 19th century when populists from Texas and Kansas came to the land and re recently opened to settlers. Disgruntled farmers facing economic hardship in Oklahoma were frequently tenant farmers at the mercy of landlords and their exorbitant interest rates that often made profit unattainable. This Jeffersonian vision of an agrarian America where farmers could own land and make a good, earnest profit was just that, a vision to many. The populists were essentially absorbed in the Democratic Party following the defeat of William Jennings Bryan in 1896, but this populist tradition lived on and was absorbed into sort of the Socialist Party citing sustained economic hardship and cooperative spirit. Oklahoma socialism was distinct and agrarian focused, and by the time Shade had moved to Carter in 1912, Oklahoma Socialist Party was one of the strongest in the nation. Oklahomans, appe Oklahomans appealed to the frayed populist tradition and coupled that with the teachings of Christianity in order to recruit members. As, scholars Jim, as scholar Jim Bissett writes, the party's concise indictment of the flaws of early 20th century America coupled with its Marxist message in terms that many Oklahomans found reasonable, made the Socialist Party of Oklahoma especially attractive to those at the bottom of society. By 1916, Socialist voters had peaked, but the Green Corn Rebellion in 1917 quickly disbanded the party. The rebellion, a gathering of black and white farmers in Oklahoma at an old socialist farm, they planned to march to Washington, D.C. to lobby for their uh, improvement of their conditions, as well as argue against World War I and the draft. They burned bridges, cut telegraph lines, ate beef, and roasted green corn, hence the name, on their march before over 400 farmers were arrested. When Michael Shade had arrived in Carter in 1912 that year, at the height of this agrarian socialism, he sought out Otto Brandstetter, the state secretary of the Socialist Party. Shade had wished to speak out on socialism, traveling throughout western Oklahoma to various schoolhouses, transforming this Marxist rhetoric for Oklahoma farmers. On his final speaking arrangement, Shade was advised by an old doctor to settle in Carter, quote, for every other man there is a socialist. Shade claimed that he had been, quote, built, bitten by some filterable virus and turned into a reformer while he was in medical school. Shortly after moving to Elk City in 1928, he wrote to G.W. Long, quote, all that I am and all that I have I owe to the socialist movement, and that he pr would provide Long with discounted health care and surgery to a fellow comrade. Shaded foreshadowed here what his envisioned community hospital would end up doing. He said, quote, surgical operations weigh heavily on the poor, and I've decided during 1929 to lift this load from the shoulders of these comrades whose name I possess. For three days, members of the Oklahoma State Farmers Union could have their surgeries performed for free and then pay minimal hospital fees. During those three days, Shaded saw numerous patients with long-standing, often incurable conditions due to a lack of preventative care. He envisioned that like the cooperative cotton gins in Beckham County, farmers should be able to pool their money together and receive adequate health care free of the rising costs of a fee-for-service fee system. His initial plan would call for 6,000 families buying a $50 share of stock to build the hospital and buy out the existing hospitals in Elk City. After the initial fundraising, farmers would pay anywhere between $25 and $50 per year for their medical and surgical care. 
$50 in 1929 equates to just under $900 today, and at 6,000 families and $50 shares, Shade had argued that he could pay eight specialist doctors nearly $19,000 per year, and family doctors could make $12,500 per year, around $330,000 and $216,000 in today's money, respectively. Shade had argued that although doctors would make the same amounts, the system would ensure that they were paid for all of their work and that the cooperative system would help train future doctors. To no real surprise, Elk City doctors were not thrilled by this vision. Shaded would seemingly threaten the profession as the medical profession was just getting uh, more authoritative and professionalized that happened a few decades earlier. In October 1929, he began meeting with Elk City farmers selling this idea of a cooperative hospital. And despite initial fundraising stalls, construction was completed in the spring of 1931. And during the grand opening ceremony attended by nearly 3,000 Oklahomans, socialist and farmers unions leaders attended and made speeches. Shaded also added remarks swearing that he would, quote, defend the hospital against the machinations of its enemies and not desert it while it's in its swaddling clothes. The cornerstone of the hospital read, quote, bear ye one another's burdens, a testament to the hospital's goals and an adaptations of a biblical verse. Members could now pay for a year's worth of medical care up front, prepaid, and other doctors fought back. First, neighboring doctors fought to exclude Shaded from the association, the Beckham County Medical Association. They sought to revoke his license and then eventually take down his cooperative hospital. The Medical Association disbanded shortly after the hospital opened and reorganized a year and a half later, purposefully excluding Shaded from the professional organization. They would also exclude other doctors that associated themselves with the hospital or worked there or took patients there. And this action proved detrimental to these now non-affiliated doctors as they could not obtain malpractice insurance to legally protect themselves. During a meeting where Beckham County physicians brainstormed what to do about this community hospital, some attacks shaded its character and race appealing to common anti-immigrant sentiment throughout the United States at this time. One doctor claimed, quote, Dr. Shaded is a schemer. He is fooling these poor farmers and radicals. He's a spellbinder and has hypnotized these poor people into building a hospital for him. Another doctor, whom Shaded claimed was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, threatened leaving the association, saying he does, quote, not want to associate himself with crooks, at least not foreign crooks, and that this country belongs to the people who inhabit it and not immigrants, end quote. Doctors even elevated their case to the American Medical Association, who in 1935 claimed the hospital was unethical. They sent a representative to observe this hospital, and Shaded argues that after this visit, the Farm Security Administration uh, developed a similar plan that would bring medical care to some 78,000 low-income farm families in 20 states. Shaded and the Farmers Union Hospital Association continued to fight against the, quote, termites, as Shaded claimed, seeking to destroy the operation. And after nearly 20 years of being excluded from the Beckham County Medical Association, Shaded and the Farmers Union sued the Medical Association for $300,000 for violating, violation excuse me, of the common law of conspiracy and antitrust statutes. One scholar has framed this lawsuit as the culmination of decades of opposition to Shaded and his hospital, and with that, decades of evidence against these physicians who sought to exclude him. After two years and numerous negotiations, the lawsuit was settled on April 22nd, 1952, kind of ironic that today's April 22nd, uh, 71 years ago today. Fred Shaded, Michael's eldest son, wrote in the community hospital bulletin, quote, Tuesday, April 22nd will go down as a real red letter day in the medical history of Western Oklahoma, end quote. Doctors in Beckham County and surrounding counties could now use the facilities of the community hospital, which was arguably one of the most advanced in Oklahoma for 1952. And they could use this hospital for their private patients and in return, quote, the doctors of community hospital were to be accepted with full rights and privileges and without discrimination into the fellowship of the country's physicians, end quote. While this legal victory was substantial and throughout the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, Shaded and his supporters had been fighting this opposition. The hospital continued to operate, but by 1956, with the advent of Blue Cross insurance plans, this all but solidified uh, the downfall of cooperative medicine in Elk City, and the hospital had closed its doors. In 1980, the original hospital was torn down. However, the impact of the community hospital had been already felt for nearly half a century. 
Evidently, Shaded's experience in medical politics was not fulfilling enough as he expanded his quest for cooperative medicine to all Americans with the campaign for Oklahoma's 7th district seat in the U.S. House of Representatives race in 1940. Throughout his campaign, Shaded ran on, quote, spreading the message of social and cooperative medical care. During one campaign speech in Cheyenne, a group, he, he's quoted, a group of boys hired by the opposition were setting off firecrackers to interrupt his speech. Other instances of deliberate interruption were common, according to Shaded, but a certain defamation intentionally attacked his race. The Vichy Beacon, uh, a local Oklahoma newspaper, published The Peddler of Rugs on July 4th, 1940, as the campaigns for OK7 intensified. Described as, quote, knowing no friend, Shadid's, quote, queer dress, hooked nose, his broken speech and queer mannerisms set him aside from the rest, the peddler of rugs, end quote. The editorial equated Shadid's vision of socialism to peddled rugs, quote, glistening in the light of hard times, but the author asked the reader, after the first washing, what will we have? Finally, the piece concludes reiterating the foreignness of Shaded, uh, writing, quote, no American parentage glorifies this person and no American philosophy blesses his doctrine. We need no off-color Jews, he was actually a practicing Christian, uh, as congressmen, nor do we need off-color capital baiting lines of thought in our national makeup, end quote. Perhaps in defense or in desperation, Shaded tried to set the record straight. He claimed that his days as a socialist were over, absorbed in the Democratic Party as a New Deal Democrat. In any case, he lost the election not once, but twice. The first was by nearly 7,000 votes. The second, after a special election, because uh, the representative who won the race passed away, he lost that again, seemingly ending Shaded's role in Oklahoma politics before it had even begun. However, his role in Oklahoma medical politics was political enough. When Sari Scott, the playwright who wrote Oracle Junction from earlier, visited the community hospital in 1945, she found buried in Shaded's desk this Vichy Beacon editorial. According to Shaded, Scott was enraged and wrote back to the editor of the Beacon demanding a public apology, quote, were I in your position, I would publish an editorial on the 4th of July this year and to the best of my ability make amends for this folly, end quote. Scott retold the editor of Shadid's, uh, Shaded's many accomplishments as, he, as she saw them, depicting his story as the quintessential American dream immigrant success story. Even reminding the editor that the initial article was published on Independence Day, Scott's plea demonstrates the popularity of Shaded by some in 1945. It was not until the first few weeks of 1954, nearly nine years later, that Scott's vision had hit the stage in Dallas. During the play's brief three-week stint at Theater 54, Michael Shaded made the four-hour trip to view one of the last showings. At 74 and now retired, Shaded said it's, it's very good and that he enjoyed Guy Spall's portrayal of him and was surprised at the resemblance in face, voice, and intonations. Jokingly, he added, but it doesn't cover all my life. The play, like I said earlier, featured three acts, just six scenes, and dramatized his life, much to the applause of theater critics. One reviewer argued that by all measurements, Oracle Junction was the best of Theater 54's play that plays that season. It was not only good theater, but it befriended a quote, doctor whose very name may still start a heated argument among men of medicine, end quote. This was just two years after the lawsuit was settled. Legacies of this dispute between shaded Oklahoma physicians and the Farmers Union remained in the years following this landmark settlement. Oracle Junction was just one of the ways Shaded's legacy was preserved. Although the play only ran for a few weeks, the reception and premise indicate that even in Cold War America, many were still struck by Shaded's life. Perhaps because of McCarthyism or the Second Red Scare, the play failed to find success elsewhere or as a motion picture as Scott had envisioned in 1945 during her visit to Elk City. The story of Michael A. Shaded in the community hospital not only took the leadership of Shaded and his family, but also the organization of impoverished far farmers in western Oklahoma. Thousands of farmers had supported this endeavor. They secured their yearly membership and sought the care of Shaded and his staff. Many of these farmers' fathers, mothers, grandparents had been populists and socialists, and in many ways, Shaded revived this populism and retooled it for the medical profession. Supported by the Farmers Union and their attorneys, the hospital found popular support and legislative success while combating Oklahoma physicians who actively worked to exclude them and shut down the hospital. Even if scholars typically point to World War I and the Green Corn Rebellion as the end of socialism in Oklahoma, 
Shaded's hospital is evidence that legacies of socialism in the Oklahoma countryside persisted. In 1992, a new generation was introduced into Shaded's story when the University of Oklahoma Press republished Shaded's crusading doctor, uh, My Fight for Cooperative Medicine, originally published in 1956. This time, it included a foreword by Ralph Nader, and Nader wrote, quote, if Hollywood is looking for both drama and historical significance in the life of one immigrant to this country, the saga of Michael A. Shaded has to be the leading candidate. The sequence was as improbable as it was heroic, end quote. Indeed, Sari Scott shared this Hollywood vision of Shaded's life, and both Nader and Scott viewed Shaded as a hero, a true doctor for the people. His life has captivated many and the legacy of Shaded continues to serve as evidence for some that socialized medicine was possible in the United States. Depicted as an anomaly, the story of Shaded in the Elk City Community Hospital not only relied on strong leadership, but the social, political, and economic factors of rural Oklahoma in the early 20th century. A fact that sometimes gets buried beneath the quote Hollywood script that was Shaded's life. Thank you.